and you are live. Welcome, and uh, good afternoon. I'd like to uh, welcome you all, welcome our, our panel here to uh, the South Fork Sea Farmers panel discussion. Uh, it's entitled Framing the Bays, Sustainable, Profitable, Restorative. We're going to have a conversation about how you all got here, the challenges, the market, profitability, um, and any good stories you have to tell. Um, and I thought we'd just begin the afternoon with uh, some brief introductions. Um, as I said, how, how did you get here? Um, and maybe we'll start with, you know, I should introduce the panel, actually. <laughs> um, Elizabeth Peoples and Stephanie Bassett. They own the Little Ram Oyster Company, and they're the owner-operators. Uh, next to them, in the middle with the purple check shirt, is Adam Eunice, uh, owner of Promised Land Mar Mariculture. And finally, Matt Ketchum, who owns and operates the Peconic Gold Oyster Farm. Matt's in Kutchog. Adam operates out of Springs. And uh, Elizabeth and Stephanie are out of Greenport, but their, their farm is uh, off of Ram Island on Shelter Island. So um, why, don't, why don't we begin with you? Um, sure. Uh, just tell us a little bit about how you, how you got here yeah. uh, to well, be oyster farmers. Elizabeth and I um, will pass it a little bit here. We, um, we were in the city as interior designers and um, in advertising for 17 years um, and realized that we needed a shift in our career. And um, we actually took a, a shucking class that was a Groupon um, and it was a little boozy and we learned how to shuck oysters and we just learned basically the 101 about them and said, okay, let's put a five-year plan down and figure out what this looks like. What is an oyster farmer? What do they do? Uh, we started traveling. We went to Rhode Island, met some farmers who kind of took us under their wing. Um, and our five-year plan turned into a six-month plan where we uh, bought a existing farm. And excuse me here. for the interruption, yes, but that it. was when um, Steph Googled, literally Googled oyster farm for sale. Yeah, and, and there was actually one. <laughs> and a <laughs> listing popped up and we had no idea if it was current or you know what the situation was, but we hopped on it and we responded to the ad and took the day off work and came out here to the North Fork. Uh, I had been out one time um, with some friends you know, for a birthday, big birthday, a few years before, but Steph had actually never been to the North Fork. so. It was kind of our first experience, wow. and um, we looked up some real estate listings, and we're just like, how you know, how would this feel if we decided to buy this farm, and you know, what, could we see ourselves living out here? And yeah, turns out we could, so we jumped on it and sold our place yeah. in Brooklyn, and we moved out here, and uh, yeah, it went um, it went by very quickly, and then we just dove into oyster farming, which we had no experience in or driving a boat. <laughs> gotta start somewhere. But you gotta start somewhere. That's true. So we did. And we were ready for and, it. And uh, yeah, every day has been a crash course, um, but it's getting easier and better and better. And uh, we wouldn't have changed a thing about our moves. Can I, uh, before Adam introduces himself, um, I, I just gotta ask have there been any really big mistakes, any big boo boos? <laughs> Not big, but you haven't definitely. run the boat aground, or <laughs> no, no, actually, we no. haven't. No, we were very careful about learning how to drive the boat. We had we had uh, private instructors, and um, and and we have very good friends in the industry um, who have helped us with our techniques along the way, and have been there for a quick call, who we can ask questions every single day. We have done that. Um, it, we did that. We don't bother those people anymore. We're we're good now, but um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was crazy. The first year was nuts. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I can't wait to get back to you guys to hear a little bit more about your experience. Um, I know Adam. Uh, I've known him for some time now, and I know his his journey included a lot of education, actually, uh, as opposed to your experience. So, <laughs> yes. so uh, Adam, why don't you fill us in? Um, okay. So, I, uh, similar to Elizabeth and Stephanie, I. Um, started my career after school um, in the city, uh, working for a carpentry firm, which I, you know, didn't particularly enjoy. So I went back to school um, and ended up getting a master's in marine biology, atmospheric sciences from Stony Brook. Um, and after that, 
uh, worked for the town hatchery of East Hampton, East Hampton Shellfish Hatchery, for almost five years. And that's kind of where I learned the trade and how to do things or, and not do things. <laughs> um, and while I was there for those five years, I was doing the paperwork to, um, to acquire one of the scalp leases, doing the DEC Army Corps stuff. Um, because scalp sounds a little bit like scallop. Oh, yeah. Like so the, the, the scalp program um, is an acronym for the Suffolk County um, Aquaculture Lease Program, so, which is throughout the Peconics. Um, so there's a, a, approximately a year process to get your lease um, and the permitting uh, to, con to, to uh, actually start farming. Um, and so I started farming in 2017 in Napeague Bay. Um, and have just slowly increased production each year, nothing crazy. Um, and, you know, let's see, it's like a five years later and just still trucking along. So it's, it's, uh, it was a good transition to get out of the city and, um, you know, do something that I've always wanted to do, which is work on the water. So, great. How about you, Matt? Well, for me, it all started on a cold, windy, rainy April day when my dad took me flounder fishing for the first time on, I think it was my fifth or seventh birthday or something like that. I froze my butt off. I caught one flounder, and for some reason, <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> Fast forward to my college years, I studied aquaculture and fisheries technology at University of Rhode Island. Uh, worked on a few oyster farms up there, did a lot of commercial fishing and also uh, working on charter boats and head boats, which I ended up running some of them too out of uh, Orient Point. But um, I, I got a great knowledge base from all these different fisheries. I know how to rig things up. I know how things work on the water. I was on different kinds of boats. Got good at um, you know some mechanical stuff. So it's given me a great uh, knowledge base which uh, has helped me and uh, you know I'm still learning every day every day we're learning out there and like Adam said still trucking along always plenty of room for uh, growth in this business you can do events you can do farm tours you can build another boat you know there's always always stuff to do um, I think it's important for for the audience to understand that you all operate on uh, on leases uh, you, you lease not bottomland. You lease an area of, of maybe someone could explain it. Actually, Adam, anyone uh, who would uh, like to explain? Sure, the I'll, lease I'll go program. ahead and attempt to do that. So the um, Suffolk County created Scalp, the, aqua, the lease program, um, going back to I believe it was established in 2009 um, to start, um, <clears throat> and so they have lease plots uh, all throughout the Baconics, as you guys know. Um, and it's, once you go through the process and you have a lease, it's, um, the majority of the time it's a 10 acre lease. Mm -hmm. Some people opt to do s smaller ones, but. You, you each have 10 acre mm -hmm. uh, leases? Okay. Yep. Um, and so from there you, uh, you know, you're leasing this land in 10 year increments from the county and, um, you know, you then apply. Uh, with different uh, state and federal agencies to grow certain species. So you can grow your, you can grow scallops, you can grow oysters, you can grow clams, but you just have to do the permitting uh, for that. Um, and you know that's kind of the gist of of the. You guys are all oysters. We're not. We're not. You guys aren't doing any scallops or clams or anything else. Okay. Currently, no. all oysters. Um, and are you all surface growers all year long, or do you sink your sink your uh, shellfish in the wintertime? Well, uh, we all have different types of gear based on our farm. So okay. in our location, because we're on the east side of Shelter Island, we are very exposed to we're, you know, Gardner's Bay and the Atlantic and anything from the east is, is pretty brutal on our farm. So because of that, we, you know, we get the great current flow for the oysters, but we also, the, you know, using floating gear on our farm doesn't necessarily make sense for us. So ours is actually the off-bottom um, cages. Oh, so that you're, off, you're off bottom. Exclusively. All the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And Adam, you're on the surface all the time, or? or um, so I have a 
the smaller stuff at the surface. Um, and then I transition it down to the bottom. So I have, you know, a hybrid. Um, but as they were saying, um, you know, come winter time, I don't think that there's anybody who keeps stuff at the surface. Right. Um, it's just too, it's too windy and it's too cold. And the oysters, you know, uh, biologically or physiologically can't handle that kind of stress. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how about you, Matt? Uh, yeah, I use what's called off-bottom cages, which are actually on the bottom. They have <laughs> little legs that keep them just off the bottom. So there's three ways to grow oysters. There's floating, which is something that floats at the surface. There's on-bottom, which means the oysters are literally on the bottom, no mesh or anything, no cage. And then there's off-bottom culture, which is any kind of gear that you can uh, deploy and haul up. So that's what we're using, three foot by four foot bottom cages, and we have different size mesh, half inch or one inch, depending on the size of the oyster. Got it, got it. So how many, how um, many bags can you get in your one of your cages? Like, do you have a six packs or 12 packs? Um, we use some of the bags because we need the small mesh for when we put seed in, but um, once they get to a certain size, they're just in the half inch mesh and we're not using uh, any bags. Okay. So nice. for my setup, that's we're really efficient at handling that. So that's how we do it. You know, since we're sort of in uh, oyster growing 101 here, we might as well just be, you know, go through the whole process here. So where do you get your seed from? Uh, how important is uh, the East Hampton shellfish hatchery or, or the, 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 the Cornell? I don't know where you get your seed. Tell, fill us in a little bit on, on how this all works. Uh, so, yeah, um, maybe start with you guys. Sure, yeah, we get, um, we vary where we get our seed. Um, we don't put all our eggs in one basket Actually, for you know different what? Good reasons. idea, explain seed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, so we, we get the majority of our seed from Karen Rivara at Eros, oh, okay. um, Cultured Oyster Company, and she is based, uh, her facility is based out of um, Southold, and they, she's one of the um, main, suppliers out here. Um, we also get our seed from Fisher's Island. We get um, seed from Rhode Island. Um, so um, there, are they different varieties or, or it depends no, on how the same much they species. cost? I mean, it, they do come at different cost and you're going to spend different amounts of money depending on what size you get. The smaller it's going to be cheaper. You just have more labor in growing it out. The larger seed is going to be more expensive um, right. as it's more hardy and it's going to grow faster on your farm. So, And, and the smallest seed that you, that you would begin with is how big? Well, it depends on if you have a flopsy, which is something that we can explain. Um, we do not have that system, which is a floating system off of your dock where you can get very, very small seed and keep growing it in a controlled um, environment. We go direct directly into bags into our cages like Matt was explaining before and so we get our seed at um, six millimeter. Okay, okay. And do, do any of you guys have the, the Fluffsy systems? I do not and I mean it's it's a really good way to you know you can buy seed um, as small as half a millimeter mm -hmm. right so um, you just like have sand. to have the, re the right mesh size to grow that out in a Fluffsy. Um, and willing participants in terms of labor mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to do a flub seed. Um, but it's cheaper, so you can get a lot of seed for much cheaper. Um, but no, I mean, it, eventually one day I'd like to have a flub seed. That's like, you know, yeah. Yeah. that really helps you, um, uh, what's the right word? Not, not expand, but like, you know, bring it to a Vertically integrate. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's another full-time job that pretty much would pay for itself. But even at the size, a lot of us get our seed, you know, six millimeter or twelve millimeter. I'm still surprised every year. I mean, they triple in size in like a week and a half. Yeah. You look at them, you're like, oh, they're not that heavy. Two days later, <laughs> you you can't get the cage up. It's so heavy, and it's all day just to just to uh, get more gear in the water to give them the space that they need. Huh. I was surprised before we went live, I was surprised to hear from you, though, that um, I, I, the mortality or loss rate is, uh, there's probably a technical term that you guys have, um, mm -hmm. yep. is, is quite high. Uh, you know, you were like almost, I, you tell me. I mean, I think you said 50%, but that, sound, that sounds, maybe that's too high. But Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, when you look at your books, you try to assume maybe 30%. That seems like maybe the industry standard, but 
you lose some here and there. Sometimes the counts are off. I mean, I can't explain it, but I know I don't sell anywhere near how much I put in the water. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even if you put more oysters in, it seems like you're selling the same amount maybe. Or in some years, all of a sudden, you don't have enough cages, but you end up selling less oysters. I mean, it's, it's really screwy. Every year is different. They die, uh, yeah. they die because of uh, uh, what? Uh, predators? Yeah, you, predators uh, when they're really small, but you know, you could have that rust tide and you could have mortality in the winter. You could have cages getting flipped and sitting for too long. You could lose some cages. I mean, um, anything can happen really. Okay. Um, how about just, you know, you guys went into the business uh, and you're five years in, uh, you had careers in New York. Is this profitable? Are you making a living? I mean, uh, yeah, wow. We are, yeah, we are making a living, and it is very profitable. Um, you, you know, people think, oh, I'm just going to be an oyster farmer. That's what I'm getting into the business for. But you are not. You are a business owner. You have to do sales. You have to do marketing. You have to do all the books. You have to be a farmer. You have to, you know, there. You are literally dabbling in every single position of owning a business, and um, and this labor on top top of it, but. Um, it is profitable. I think we all are in it because we see how um, much potential there is. It's just about getting more support from the county and from New York in general um, to, for all of us to be able to expand our farms in a way and, and get financial support even so we can be using better equipment, have better farm locations, have more support in general so we can build the industry and, and really, really push the profit forward. It is a very profitable job and, and, and industry as long as there is the backing and the support behind it. So there are obstacles. Uh, you guys will, could grow. Uh, and Absolutely. Maybe all of you want to grow, uh, but what are the obstacles to growing? Um, maybe, Matt, why don't, uh, why don't you fill us in a little bit on that one? Well, I think we've all um, been a little bit limited by the bureaucracy. Um, you know, a lot of paperwork, as Adam alluded to before, we need permits from, I think, five different agencies, Army Corps, Coast Guard, DEC, Department of State, the county, your local town. Um, and I think, you know, maybe we can take a page out of Rhode Island's book or Connecticut's book. You know, Rhode Island has the Coastal Marine Resources uh, Council. It's one streamlined process, one agency you have to deal with in Connecticut. Uh, the shellfish bottom is, for the most part, regulated by the Department of Agriculture. And here, you know, we have a lot of these agencies that can't seem to get on the same page. And, um, you know, we're all in the county program, which has great intentions, but um, the paperwork has really limited um, our ability to grow our businesses. Are there available, uh, are there additional available lease sites? And why don't you just get them? That'd be uh, great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Adam, why don't you? Sure. Yeah. So um, it, we do have uh, the potential to expand our farms, um, but we have Can to. Can I just elaborate there? So, yeah. so you have the cash flow, the desire, um, and, the, and the ability to expand your farm. Absolutely. And so so what, what I'm talking about is, can you get more acres? Yeah, you just have to go through the all all the steps pretty much all over again. Mm. So um, you have to, you know, go through the lottery system in order to get a lease. Um, well, is that correct? Um, until this just recently, this spring, oh, right, we actually yeah. could not get another lease. Oh, yeah. you could. Um, that wasn't an option for. Have you guys applied for? Are you all looking for more more turf? More, We're all trying, not turf. We're trying to, <laughs> but it's a matter of getting responses. Communication. We uh -huh. had a lack of communication on that. Front, well, I think Adam is just hoping <clears throat> that he gets his renewal, right? Mm. He's just hoping to continue farming. I've been trying to relocate for years. Looks like I'm getting close, but you know. Uh, Businesses like ours, we should be able, we should get first dibs at another spot to grow. We're already ready to hire people. We have the equipment. We have the means of producing more. Um, I think we saw a lot of these leases got given out to full-time school teachers that have no intention of farming. People with no boat, no truck, and they've been sitting on their lease doing nothing. We're rearing and ready to go. Uh, this is sort of getting off the topic, but I'm just kind of, I think anyone would be curious. So why would a, I don't know. A teacher, why would that happen? Why would someone want to 
uh, an oyster lease or shellfish lease if they're not going to use it? Well, I think, you know, if you want to grow a few oysters, maybe somebody like that should be given uh, five acres and, you know, show a little activity. I think that's great. I think uh, a lot of the public sh should be getting involved, but for full-time business owners and full-time growers, I think we should be given more yeah. opportunities to grow. It um, seems like a, it also seems very dreamy, you know, like for us, we were like, oh, we want to do this. I mean, we did it though, but we left our jobs and, and, and really, really committed, you know, and I think a lot of people who go through this lottery system are probably like, oh, what a dream, what a dream, you know, then we'll leave our jobs as a teacher, whatever this is, and then they, they never make the move, mm -hmm. and then it's just sitting there stagnant, and everybody who's full-time on the water working every single day, um, you know, making a living and trying to make a living for other people who want to make a living on the water and expand our businesses are unable to do so, and then like Adam said, it, 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 the process starts all over again, and there is no streamlining, and, be, and so therefore we have to wait for this agency to get back to us. So there's and no then, uh, facilitator, at, I mean, because there is a sense that I get at least that, uh, you know, there's political will behind, hey, this is a good thing, and the county, you know, there's mm -hmm. this lease program. So the pieces are in place, but there's no one in the county who's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make a call. In six months, you'll have your lease. That doesn't work like that. Who's like a facilitator who's mm -hmm. there to help you make sure that you can actually expand this thing? No. It's no. up to you. No, we're, yeah. not getting, we're not getting this from them. Right, right. And we right. are all very efficient human beings. You have to be as a farmer on the water with, uh -huh. with oysters. And so we are getting more done every single day than anybody can imagine. So for all of us to have to kind of sit on our hands and be like, we, we can't do anything about this. So what I'm hearing from you is that there's plenty of demand for oysters. You could produce more oysters and sell more oysters. Absolutely. New York could be thriving. Okay. So this is a, a successful business vein in, in, in out here. Okay, so that's, a, that's one thing we've established. There's other goods, right? This is good for the water. This is good for water quality. I hear, I, you know, I'm told. Uh, um, yeah, Stephanie, can you fill us in on why is this good for the water? I mean, explain that a little bit. Um, yes, I, I will pass the science part of it. Um, to or the right, is, but is there some, I mean, are you, are you no. good on this or, uh, you know, uh, I don't no, know. I mean, yeah, if you yeah, can. I mean, the, the scientific part, um, you're probably more capable yeah, of I'll, answering, I'll give it a, the, I'll give it a jab. I mean, I think the one thing we've observed is that what has happened on our farm is it's this little kind of micro ecosystem that's evolved, like the oyster cages, our cages are um, similar to what uh, Matt explained, ours are a little bit smaller footprint, but they're still, you know, the off bottom that sit on the little feet on the bottom of the bay. And all of a sudden around our farm is this, it, it, you know, the, the oysters are there and they're attracting all this um, marine life and, you know, the, the local baymen are wanting to put their pots, fish pots around our farm and realizing the benefit of mm. what the oysters and having these, you know, kind of mini reefs are bringing to the, to the bays. I mean, so. it's conch, eel, bass, yeah. porgy, I mean, you name it, it's there. Yeah, and you our know? farm and is... we see dolphins swimming right off of our, you know, like in the water as well. I mean, it is, it's thriving. Our Seals farm is and... historically Bunker City is what the locals call it. And oh. it's, you oh. know, they're cool. back. Awesome. <laughs> so the underwater ecosystem yeah. is one thing. And then what the oysters oysters are doing are filtering the water and cleaning it um, and you know an oyster a day is filtering 50 gallons of water so you mm -hmm. times that by millions and millions of oysters on our farm and boom you've just created this like filtration system for the entire bay that is just like constantly working you know right, right. Um, Adam, yeah. uh, you and Matt are both uh, you studied you know, marine sciences. Uh, so w what's that filtration? Can you explain that filtration thing? Yeah, I'll give it my best shot. It's been a while. Um, so, you know, first of all, the, the biodiversity um, that you see once you put structure in the water is, it's like every year I'm always amazed. And I, you know, you, you go from a spot that has, you know, no life in early, early April, um, become this time of year, you know, scupper showing up, silver sides are showing up. Um, anyway, but the, so that's, you know, just one aspect of it. But the filtration part, I think, you know, people always mention filtration with oysters. And um, I think it's important to, yes, they're like, they're constantly filtering the water, but what they're doing is they're, they're feeding off of algae. So, you know, when we talk about excess nutrients, um, you know, people talk about nitrogen and carbon and phosphorus. So those are all, you know, essentially elements that uh, phytoplankton 
will use to grow themselves. So that's why if there's excess nutrients in the water, you're going to see excess phytoplankton. And so it's kind of like the, the, the middleman here is the algae. So the, middle, the algae will kind of, they will take up this excess nutrients to make themselves and replicate. Um, and then the oysters take advantage of that and, and uptake, uptake that food. Mm. So it's, it's kind of like the, uh, the you know, that's how I understand it, that the algae is kind of acting as a, um, a middleman, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, the, uh, you know, I'm, I, am I wrong to understand that, that I thought oysters also remove nitrogen from the water, or there was, they're, they're a nitrogen filter, you know, they, they, they reduce the nitrogen content in the water, is that correct? Yeah, so they're, they're reducing Which that nitrogen. Which is a real problem out here. Yeah, so and part of part of what they're doing is removing that nitrogen because algae need nitrogen in order to multiply, in order to split. So what they're doing is uptaking that nitrogen that's been affixed to algae. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's they're incorporating it into their uh, so the reduction, cells. The reduction in nitrogen in the water. Uh, then there's less algae production, and the algae will, can actually choke out oxygen, which is which is bad for which Correct. is bad for water quality. Yeah. So they'll what will happen is um, um, the algae, if there's excess algae, it dies, goes to the bottom, and then starts to decompose. Uh, right. Yeah. So bacteria then all of a sudden are sucking up all the oxygen hmm. in order to uh, to eat all of this algae, and there's only so much oxygen in the water. So if they're taking all of it, that's when you get these hypoxic zones or dead zones. And uh, so uh, people always ask, uh, okay, so if oysters are taking all this bad stuff out of the water, uh, why should I be eating oysters? <laughs> why why is it okay to eat oysters? Can you can you explain that one? Yeah, so I think it kind of goes into the explanation I was talking about before. So you the oysters aren't really taking up all this bad stuff in the water. The algae is using those, those chemical compounds that are, we, you know, we're saying it's the, the bad nutrients. Right, But right. for them, it's nutrients. It's nutrients. So they're, they're sucking that up, making their bodies, splitting. Um, Processing it. Pro yeah. yeah, and turning them, you know, making more algae, right? Because right, right, there's right. more nutrients. Right. And so it's not as if the oysters are just straight up taking bad stuff out of the water, the, the algae do it to, to form them, you know, to form their own cells and split. Um, and then because there's more of it, the oysters are able to take advantage of it. Hmm. Hmm. What, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but it's an interesting one nonetheless. Um, you know, you guys aren't scallop, scallop farmers, uh, and scallops have that, that season in the wintertime, uh, and it's been fluctuating a lot. It's actually up and down and down mostly lately. Um, what's going Not on? here fishes for them, though. Oh, you do? What's I have some on my farm, too. But you do? Oh, OK. What, what, what do you think? Uh, uh, I get asked that a lot. And I don't know. This has happened in the past. I don't know um, what years. But we have had die-offs like this for a year or two, and then it come back. So the scallops that are out there now are spawning right around now, I think. And uh, hopefully they survive so that we can catch them before they die. The small ones have been surviving. We're not allowed to keep those. So they've still been spawning and reproducing, but they're dying before we can catch them. They have a short life cycle, around 18 months. And I think their life cycle has just been uh, off track a little bit. Maybe they're spawning a little bit early. It's coinciding, coinciding with the really warm water temperatures, they're a little bit stressed out, and they're experiencing a lot of mortality before we're allowed to go get them uh, the first week in November. And do you raise them to market size? Yeah, and the, and the funny thing is, um, I haven't seen one scallop die in my cages. Amazing. They all seem to survive, Amazing. and there's a lot of different theories that, oh, it, it's because they're, um, because predators are eating them, like cow nose rays are suddenly coming up here because the water's warm and people think those are eating them. Or uh, one theory I think has something to do with it is the low oxygen levels when we have the harmful algae blooms. Um, 
you get those low oxygen levels all the way at the bottom, and I think the scallops may be a little more sensitive um, to that. And I will just say on what we were talking about before, I cut school a lot to go fishing, but I think um, what I would say is oysters are just a keystone species, and they keep the algae in check. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really simple. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the answer. Uh, keystone species out here that keeps the algae in check. I mean, algae will choke the bays and yep. kill the life, take, suck all the oxygen out of the water um, clear enough. So if you guys were to <coughs> itemize, um, it sounds like you're all, I mean, I know that, that you, you, know, you want to move your, your site, and that's been a big struggle. Um, uh, and I know that you're, you're waiting for your lease renewal, and that's stressful. Um, but, but as far as businesses are concerned, you, you all are doing well, uh, and you'd like to grow. Um, so is, the, is finding more space your biggest challenge, or are there other challenges that we don't know about? I would say space on land as much as space yeah. on the water. Yeah. Um, we need a spot to put our cages. We need a spot to load our gear onto our boat. We need a spot to get process. Five, to process, uh, you know, and tumble your oysters. Me, I have a boat that's out on a mooring now. I need a safe, calm spot for it. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff you can't just do in your backyard. Your neighbor's going to complain. You can't just do it at a dead end street or at the ramp. You know, we need a place to work. Uh, you know, my dockage doubled this year. There's a real lack of walking, uh, working waterfront. Um, so, you know, maybe some sort of co-op area. Um, and there's some ideas like that being tossed around, but it needs to be logistically feasible for everybody to share it and use it. Mm -hmm. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah, 100, yeah I think so. I think one of the major issues that most farmers, or unless they have their own waterfront, space is um, having a working waterfront uh, compared to other states uh, nearby it, um, Long Island just just doesn't have any more wa working waterfront like and I think like a, a community owned uh, uh, working dock uh, commercial yeah. fishing dock where where oyster farmers could could be a, be a staging area basically mm -hmm. yeah 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 um, well I've been focusing a lot on on sort of challenges even though clearly business is good um, and I I think I want to ask you too because you your experience was you bought a, a site you, you bought an, a business mm -hmm. um, and you haven't faced some of the least challenges that Adam and Matt have faced um, I want to hear a little bit about the fun like you know like the good stuff right uh, you decided to become oyster farmers. Like, is it, is it, is it, is it, is the payback in that arena good? Is it working? Like, does it feel good? Oh yeah, absolutely. 100%. I mean, I, everybody who's an oyster farmer decides to be one, you know, it's whether you're in that field or not. Um, it's a big commitment. Um, but yeah, our lives have changed significantly. We not only bought a farm, um, but we also moved and had a baby all in a year. And so we really did all of the things that you're not supposed to do at all, all at once, all at once. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> which was amazing. Um, but no, it's, it, it's, it's a dream working on the water. You know, I appreciate the rainy days. I appreciate just being outside. I appreciate everything that nature has to offer. And the industry um, has been, and, and the people in the industry are wonderful. And being in this community is, uh, we feel closer to people out here than we ever did in the city. Oh, that's and, such a nice thing. And we thing. have a connection to the land. We have a connection to um, our community, and it has been um, it's been wonderful just diving in. And you know, Elizabeth and I are doing everything that we can to be as much a part of all of the aspects um, in order to to just try to be um, a, a big component in moving things forward because. While this lease program is started in 2009, yeah. um, it's a very young beginning of this industry. Again, it, we're, we're right at the very, very beginning. And, and we know, like we all know that we all need to support each other, link arms, have each other's backs in order to push this thing forward and open the doors for other farmers and open the doors to other opportunities for all of us. And so that has been very um, wonderful, leaving the industry I was in before going into this one and and realizing that we can make a difference 
Well, yeah. and I, I think, you know, we're the, what we've done is, you know, starting in 2009, this program allowed the resurgence of a historical industry out here. And, you know, though it looked a little different, they were, you know, dredging oysters and they were grown on reefs as opposed to in cages, kind of more farm farm based. Uh, you know, we have the opportunity to create the new aquaculture industry out here and that's what we're doing right now and I think that's really exciting and you know part of that is really trying to create kind of the appellation of the oyster and you know that this whole region is incredibly rich in its you know its history and you know with the the, the oyster industry and the agriculture <laughs> and wine is relatively new but you know the, it, it's critically important for this region, for the state, for the industries to, to really get that out there. And I think that's where, you know, we've talked about a lot about support. And I think that that's where, you know, having the support from New York State, having the support um, from the region in order to really get that out there so that people say, oh, yes, Long Island oysters, those are the best. We want those when they order them on the menu or ask for them or, you know, are these from Long Island? You know, I think that's that's it's, part of our responsibility. Historically, that's that's been the case well, his, everyone I mean knows I know that blue points I know that blue points are now yeah. right. in connect from Connecticut but or at least they're based in Connecticut but blue point oysters are from Long Island and, and exactly. Uh, exactly. as you guys know um, New York was the oyster capital of the world yeah yes it was it had the highest production of oysters anywhere N New York Harbor yeah. mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a time when that was the poor man's food I mean um, you know, this yeah. is stuff I know. I've read this stuff, but where that was the stuff of poor man's food, you know, oyster stews. Uh, people would just go down to the foot of Manhattan and get their dinner. Mm -hmm. um, can't do that anymore because of water quality. But uh, that's a really interesting point. And the other point that you made, that you, Elizabeth, made about no. you're at the beginning okay. of, of this business. You're at the beginning of a new phase of it. Um, because yeah. oyster farming out here existed for a long time, and it, mm -hmm. it changed right around the time when, when you know, turn, turn of the century, really, the late, 19, late you know, 1900s, when they started the lease program, basically. I mean, they were scattering oysters. Maybe you guys can jump in here. Maybe someone knows this better than I do, but, you know, there were bottom-growing oysters, oyster farms here uh, for 100, 100 years or more, um, and then they began the... Suffolk County Aquaculture Lease Program. Yeah, I think um, historically they, you know, we're, Matt talked about it uh, earlier, that's, they were doing a process of farming, uh, which is called on bottom. Right. You know, they just scatter. With, with the, yeah, so you just, you let them go and uh, let nature do whatever, you know, then you're, you're really putting them, you know, depending on their size in harm's way at the bottom, because uh, that's where all their predators are. And you know, um, sponges, crabs, starfish, I mean, you name it. Um, so the benefit of having, you know, a um, more technology, if you will, we're talking about, you know, wire cages here. They're not, mm. <laughs> they're nothing <laughs> yeah. particularly. But that, it, you know, out, out in Long Island, Eastern Long Island, um, it's historically, you know, a farming and fishing community and so you know sometimes when I talk about this I you know that's what shellfish farming that's what shellfish aquaculture is it's like the the marriage between those two and so it just fits with the narrative of, well, it, would of be, it would be really interesting you know what we're seeing right now and what we've been seeing for the last 30 years is the decline of the baymen here the inshore fishing right mm -hmm. um, the, the traps um, the traps that are those nets that we see extending from the shore, but also crab traps and lobster pots and other ways of making a living just within, say, a mile from shore. What mariculture, like what you guys are doing, uh, could be the future for a portion of the future uh, because your profitability, your success is not something that necessarily Bayman are seeing. Right. Um, and it's, it's really lovely to hear. I know that you're all struggling to a certain extent. You have your challenges, but it's really awesome to hear from a economic, cultural standpoint that 
business is good. I mean, inshore fish growing business is good. Wow, that's, that's great for this region. That is just really great. And it's not a question, but it's so important. Um, Let's see, what else? Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the future, you know, like, do you hand this down? Do you, do you, how, how, how does this continue? How does this grow, you know? I mean, I don't know if you all have thoughts about that, but. Uh. Well, I will say, you know, we're talking about the 1900s and growing oysters on the bottom. The oysters were sort of there naturally already. They're more or less ranching it. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, we have an uphill battle. Those oysters are not there anymore, which is why we're buying them and putting them in cages. So we have an uphill battle because we're also, we're not in naturally productive areas. We're in undesirable locations where, uh, in theory, nobody complained about us being there, you know, after rigorous public comments and stuff. But I, I, I like being, in, I love being an advocate for this industry and for all farming, but um, I think we have a lot of growth left if, if we're allowed to. We have st our surrounding states growing kelp now, which is great for the environment, also makes great fertilizer and a variety of uh, soap and food products. I mean, mm -hmm. kelp kimchi, kelp sauerkraut, kelp noodles, kelp broth, vitamins, um, and they could supplement it with um, uh, uh, food for animals that ends up being better for the environment and saving money on food. Um, so we have that, you know, that's going on commercial aquaculture, kelp culture in our surrounding states. And we, we just finally passed legislation here to allow us to do it. But, um, you know, there's uh, some more paperwork to be done before we're allowed to grow it commercially, especially in the Suffolk County lease program. So uh, we're hoping that, you know, within a couple of years we can really start um, experimenting with that because it's going to take some industry leaders and guys that are already growing to figure it out and work out the kinks and uh, figure out, you know, efficient, uh, environmentally friendly ways to grow the stuff here and also to develop uh, the markets more. There's definitely a lot of potential. Yeah, unlike oysters, that, that's, that's one of the challenges is, is developing the demand, developing the market. I mean, there's definitely a market for it, as you pointed out, um, you know, for fertilizer. I think that's beginning. And as you also pointed out, yeah, the, the, state, the state just passed a law um, on this, which is great. Kelp farming will begin soon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, that's, has oyster consumption increased? I mean, this demand that you can't quite meet yet or this demand that you would like to meet more of um, is there where's it coming from is it just people eating oysters is it being shipped abroad is it what's what's the what's behind this are people getting dialed into eating oysters now again or what's going on with the I think oyster it's consumption twofold. I mean I, I think the eating raw oysters oysters on the half shell it, it's definitely come back in like a vengeance people want you know half shell oysters all the time part of it has to do with COVID um, you know, people got very close to their food when they were cooking it at home and they wanted more, it was, they needed more and more in their homes, you know, and, and more variety. And so, um, luckily for us, we were able, well, on the, um, on the North Fork, we were able to have farm stands as oyster farmers. And, you know, we were talking about this with Matt earlier. I mean, the farm stand blew up. People just went nuts getting those oysters in their homes and, and learning how to shuck them and learning how to cook with them and grilling them and all these different things that you could do with them. And I just think that the, the generations that are growing right now, the younger generations, they very much care about what they're putting in their body. And they're getting, they're very knowledgeable about, you know, every single component and, and oysters are, we talk about how wonderful they are for the for the environment. They're also packed with minerals and vitamins, and like every single oyster that you're putting in your body is just like packing a punch of goodness. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's part of it. You know, when it comes to New York oysters, it's a top shelf product, and people don't understand that because when oysters went away in New York, you know, in Massachusetts they started. You know, there was the well fleet and then, you know, and, and there's the Beausoleil's and there's all these like fancy oysters coming over and all of the restaurants in New York um, City had this range of, you know, of, of these different oysters on their menus and none of them were New York. In fact, the New York oyster was the cheapest one on the menu and continued to be a couple years ago. What people are realizing now and what we are responsible 
as farmers um, t of doing is 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 educating the chefs in New York City and you know and and the people at home who love oysters how top shelf our oyster actually is because when you put them on a plate they're like oh we want those and we're like oh those are New York <laughs> by the way you right. know and that and they it, taste them and, and yeah they yeah. and so it's it's it, it's about education <laughs> it's about backing you know um, but it also we have a very like Matt says, we have it's an uphill climb because not only is it us trying to grow our businesses, trying to find people who will support working waterfront area, um, but it's also our jobs and our you know responsibility to educate the public and educate the chefs and educate these um, you know eaters about. Are, are you guys doing that local. kind of thing? Are you are you showing up at at restaurants or, or do you do that kind of education? I, I mean, mean, I know you do events, Matt, right? So, yeah, so you're out there events. shucking at, at parties or... Yeah, we, yeah. we shuck at uh, James... And people Port. are asking you probably where your oysters are from. Yeah, or yeah, we shuck a lot at James Port Farm Brewery uh, out in Riverhead. And then they're asking us, oh, where can we get your oysters? And we tell them about the farm stand. And um, like, like they said, you know, people really want to know where their food comes from now. And... I used to have to go knocking on uh, restaurants' doors when I first started, and you know I had to sell my product a little bit. I thought it would get tougher with more and more people uh, in this growing. industry, but yeah. now restaurants just have four different kinds of oysters on their menu. And Greenport, there's more <coughs> restaurants, and out here there's more restaurants. And you know we lost all our city sales with COVID, but I still can't grow enough oysters. I mean, it's gotten easier to sell oysters, I think. Huh, huh. Yeah. When. Uh, when is the when are the best times to eat oysters? When do oysters taste all the time? All the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> they're they're they taste different, you know, throughout the year for sure, um, based on their their sort of life um, processes. But I mean, we actually started a, um, a CSA program this year, um, community supported aquaculture, uh, to for some of the people that we noticed at our farm stand um, because. Just going back to that, it, the benefit of that through COVID was we actually got to meet our neighbors and oh, cool. you know people that we didn't have a chance to interact with, and you know they would stop us on the street all the time and um, you know talk about the educational aspect. It kind of all pulls into to one spot, but they, you know, these were people who really wanted to know more and more about oysters, and so you know our, our idea there was to to offer a year-round kind of membership to them where they're picking up the oysters weekly and have the opportunity to taste the difference and you know throughout the the beginning of the season through the end of the year when you know right before um, they go dormant for the winter they're really kind of you know gorging themselves on food so they're the they're most plump and meaty and most people think that you know the summertime is like you know oyster time and it, any time is but it's just it's interesting to to be able to taste that difference throughout yeah, the year yeah, yeah. i mean i i I like them in the spring and in the fall. Summer's good too. Yeah. Winter's <laughs> and good. And winter, yeah. yeah winter's <laughs> good. Um, um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about being women in this business. Is it? A, is it? I mean, fishing is quite ma fishing. Period is quite 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 male dominated. But um, have you faced any particular challenges being women in this? No, I don't think so. I mean, you had kind of mentioned that we you might ask that question earlier, and I was trying to think of what an answer to that would be. And you know, it's mm -hmm. uh, we got some guns too. We yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, I think that the the industry as a whole has been very open and supportive of us being new farmers and us being women. And you know, I I don't think that it's it it stands out as, oh, we're women oyster farmers, though I know that's something that everyone is kind of drawn to um, for the story and, you know, to to reach out and find out about it. Um, I do, you know, based on our, we do have smaller scale cages. I think Matt referenced a, like three foot by four foot. Ours are two foot by three foot. So they are a little smaller and more manageable, but that actually has to do with the boat size, not necessarily for us. And, mm -hmm. you know, this the setup on, on the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't I mean, know if you have any. Yeah, like the first year that we were out there, we definitely got the side eye. Um, you know, people were like, who are these Who are these girls coming in here? You know, whether it was. But it's also because we were coming from the city and, you know, new. change of career. Yeah. And, new and, and, and yeah. newcomers in a small town anyways. Whether of course. You're yeah, yeah exactly. So we knew yeah. that. But and, and we're a couple too. You yeah. Know, there are all, all sorts of layers. There. Yeah, we yeah. had layers. Um, so we knew that we knew that, but 
the industry took us in really well, um, we, and we formed some really good relationships within that. And then um, the Baymen actually took us in really well too. We got very close to about five different Baymen out who like to drop their cages by our farm. And, and then all of our boats are in the same area in Greenport anyways. And what I used to, she was pregnant, so there was a, about a year that I was farming out there by myself every day. And the Baymen started, we, I, we got very close to them and they started checking on me. And I started noticing, they'd come over, I'd be anchored, working, working, working all day. They'd come over, you talk to me for like 20 minutes. And I was like, all of a sudden I was like, are you checking on me? And then he was like, yeah, you know, I am, <laughs> you know? And so all of a sudden we started building this relationship. And um, then I had some phone numbers of people that I could text if I needed help. You know, one time I needed to tow and I just, I, I needed to know what to do, you know? And, 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 and things started happening. Then we started doing like some fun seafood swaps, you know, I'll trade you a bluefish for some oysters. You know, we had fun with, with, with that as well. But, um, but it did take a moment to ha form those relationships out there. And every time we met someone new, we were like, who's this guy? <laughs> you know, what does he want from me? Um, <laughs> but that guard quickly went down and we realized, oh my gosh, it's a very tight community and, uh, and it's all out of goodness. And people are literally like, I'm out on the water every day too. I yeah. got you if you need anything. Yeah. And, and then you see all your friends, you know, circling, going around their pots, dropping new ones. And, you know, we start experimenting on our farm a little bit. Like, why don't you put your pots a little closer to the farm? Maybe, maybe the predators will be pulled away, you know? And, and that's kind of fun too. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, your we have a team of all women, ironically. Uh, we didn't mean to, but um, oh, we so are, we're you're, hard workers. Your two uh, employees were women as well. Uh, three. Three, three. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We are open yeah. to hiring men as well. <laughs> it just, <laughs> the, I guess, that, it just turned out yeah. that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, I, I think all of our struggles are exactly the same as, well, as and anyone else's. We're incredibly hardworking. I mean, everyone yeah. is in this industry. You don't just, you know, decide to be an oyster farmer and not work hard. So, you know, I think that that shines through everything mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, other people's perspective of us as women and, you know, being new to the industry. So your your commute is from Greenport around the north uh, east side of uh, Shelter Island. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it's like 10 minutes, 15 minutes to, to it's your. like 15, 15 to 20, 20 15 depending. 20. Yeah. And Adam, where where do you where do you keep your boat? Uh, so my boat is uh, moored up in Lazy Point. Oh, okay, so you're in Lazy Point, and so you're close to your to your yeah. Your it's, ground. it's about ten minutes, if that. Yeah, um, and Matt, uh, I do want to hear a little bit about a little bit about your story because your commute is more complicated, uh, and it is actually illustrative of some of the challenges that uh, you face in particular. But but to a certain extent, oyster farmers out here could could face with the lease program. So you you're based in Kutchog, uh, but you have to cross. Peconic Bay to your site, which is off off of uh, basically North Sea or off Sabonic in Southampton. Yeah, correct. Uh, you know, I got my two dock slips, the ramp, my mooring, my equipment, my home, you know, my whole life and my whole business in Kutchog. We've been trying to relocate to there where there's unused spots. From from, from your site in off of Southampton. Yeah, my yeah. current spot is in Southampton, which is over an 18 mile round trip. There's you know, most days during the week in the winter, you can't get down there and back safely. We have a lot of equipment we have to get down there and back, uh, you know. Because of, of weather, weather, seas. Yeah, I mean, safety number one, but yeah, just wear and tear on your equipment and the fuel every day. I mean, it's, it's very costly every day, time consuming and dangerous. And it's uh, definitely hurt my business and my, 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 uh, my mental, I think too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, it's almost over, so you know, a lot of uh, time and paperwork. So now I just gotta get all my permits from the other agencies now, which I'm having a hard time getting a hold of. But hopefully that that I'll be over soon, and I could start moving my stuff closer to home. So you have a lease uh, near, much close near Kutchog, basically. I will have a lease right there. Uh, logistically, it'll be better, and most most importantly, it'll be much safer for my crew and I. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. And. Uh, a lot less expensive. Yeah, a lot less expensive. Yeah, I mean, I mean those we're in business. Fuel costs, so if you're going back there, you know, five, six, seven times a Yeah, a 60 miles round trip every day is a, is a nightmare. You know, we're going to cut our costs. Boy, that's going to be found now. money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've, we've made it. We've, we've made it so far dealing with this, and now it's going to be easy. Right, right, right. Um, so I'm curious about 
Okay, so you, 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 you uh, numbers. I think you said, you guys told me you put in 750,000 oysters per year, right? We do, and, yeah. And we're, we're in our fourth year of farming. And, and what do you harvest every year? Well, right, currently we're still working on our 2019 seed. Um, and we're, we're close to getting through that. But, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, so I guess we harvest most of it. But there's, there's I would say, probably a 20% die off um over the winter from you know what so you'll says. sell six hundred thousand oysters a year um no um, mortality no. is a little higher than that mortality is higher than that yeah i mean and also stuff is not going to grow at the same rate so I see. you know okay. we are we haven't even touched anything from from last year that we put in so okay. that's not going to happen till later this year um so we'll keep working on 2019 so yeah i mean we'll probably I don't know. We'll probably do like 400,000 uh -huh, this okay. year. And Adam, how about you? What are your numbers like? I'm a, I'm a bit smaller. So um, I'm buying about 200, 250,000 uh, little seeds. Um, and each year I'm selling approximately half of that. Okay. You know, okay. I lose there's some to mortality, some I give back to the ocean because it doesn't look right. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, there's certain, you know, you can't sell, um, you know, certain things. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, we all talked about scaling up. Like that's, it's bringing something like this to scale is what it's all about. Um, and then that really. Because you have more capacity, even you, just you, you have more capacity alone. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say I have a, a a decent amount more capacity but i'm i'm right now just a one-man band like so i'm you know everything right, right um it's but i think with the labor changes um in the economy i think that's gonna you know i'll have at least uh one and a half employees you know in a month from now um how many oysters are you putting in every year matt uh Around three quarters of a million, but I don't know where they go. And uh, <laughs> you know, I do events, and people always ask me, "Do you seed the bay?" So <laughs> when, I, when I roll up to a cage and it's spilt over because it blew 40 the day before, and there's oysters all over the bottom, I tell my crew, "You can tell them yes now because we seed the bay." <laughs> um, so we've got a couple minutes left, and. Uh, you know, I, I just wondered if you all have anything else you want to add. I mean, it was interesting, Matt, that you said earlier, and, and this, this conversation, which has been so interesting and fun, uh, is demonstrative of that, that you have to go out and, and, and make your case. I mean, you're at the beginning of a new, somewhat, something of a new industry. Uh, I use that word cautiously, uh, industry. But uh, so you, I mean, you don't, you, know, you don't necessarily see all kinds of farmers, all growers of all things out advocating for what they do um and it's super cool that you that you do it um and i think you guys are great uh sales of your of your world and what you do uh, but I, I just wondered if you have anything anything in particular that i might not have asked you or that i left out you know i think one one thing i was going to say earlier um you know we were talking about the future all right scaling up business the business side of it obviously there's that future but um, you know when you look globally at what is sold um, on the seafood market between aquaculture and wild stock the the trend doesn't you know you, the numbers don't lie so aquaculture all over the world whether it's shellfish or bluefin tuna you know those that industry is growing so the you know um, I, I really you know, I strongly believe that the future of the way we're going to be eating marine <coughs> species will be, you know, mainly through aquaculture because that that's that that's the way it is now. The one the one thing I will say, we've got 30 seconds and yeah. I'm glad I'm be able to get this in. Um, there's a lot of, of of chatter about some some other aquaculture, but oyster aquaculture, actually, there's very little negative about it. I sat once had dinner with Sylvia Earle, who's a famous marine biologist, and I asked her, so what fish can I eat? And she said, oysters. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a direct positive impact. Yes, that was it. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.